Well, this morning, uh, between now and lunchtime, we have an opportunity to talk about the response to the debt problems that people are so anxious about, uh, both in Europe and around the world. To, uh, we'll really do this over the course of two sessions. This first one pertains to the notion of uh, inflation and uh, austerity as we, ways of addressing the problem. And the second one, which I'm sure many of the authors in the first panel will talk about, is, is also the restructuring of debt. To lead this panel, I'm very uh, happy to say a very good old friend of mine, David Smick. He is the founder and editor of the International Economy and of the consulting firm uh, Johnson Smick International. And I just remember fondly when I first entered the, uh, I left Washington where he and I first met. And uh, when I first joined in the private sector, I had to come get acquainted in Germany, primarily in those days, Bonn and Frankfurt. And the person who gave me the, how we say, the best advice and guidance in those days was David Smick. So I'm very grateful to have him back here to give you and the panelists guidance in the first session this morning. Dave? Well, I think we have a terrific panel. Um, this morning's topic, inflation and austerity, uh, reminds me of an incident that occurred uh, in my first job back in 1975 when I was a staff advisor on the committee uh, uh, of the United States Senate. The eminent economist Arthur Oaken came to testify one day, and a senator asked him a, a question about inflation, and I will never forget uh, the response. Oaken said, we don't understand inflation. We never have. And in the 37 years since then, never has an economist been so lacking in hubris. And since then, we've had an era of economic hubris. And today, we have an economics profession that knows so much, but apparently understands so little. So, Let's begin by looking at the ugly global picture since the beginning of the great financial crisis. Using a combination of government bailouts, guarantees, central bank monetary injections, stimulus spending, and all the various other schemes, the world's policymakers committed an amount totaling $17 trillion, an astonishing one quarter of the world's GDP, in an attempt to levitate the assets on bank balance sheets. And of course, policymakers also piled on mark-to-market -market accounting, tax, and regulatory forbearance. This elite game of trying to prop up bank assets has been like trying to defy the laws of gravity. And the results to date, between 2008 and the beginning of this year, global GDP increased by only 5%. At the same time, global debt increased by 14%. The world may have avoided a depression, but the over-indebted global economy has now grown by an anemic 1.5% average annual rate. That's a dangerous stall speed. To be sure, global policymakers deserve credit for moving quickly, but have they set up a, false set, a set of false criteria by which to judge their success? Their report card contains only two grades one for preventing another layman-like event, and the other for preventing a dramatic breakout of inflation or deflation. But shouldn't there be an additional grade? That's the grade in the event of a japan light scenario, particularly for the United States and Europe, an extended slow bleed scenario of economic mediocrity. The Congressional, U.S. Congressional Budget Office already predicts the U.S. economy over the next several decades will grow around a 2% annual rate compared to 3.5% in the post-war period. Uh, the global economic system is experiencing monstrous, le monstrous levels of public debt, almost universally underperforming economies, in some cases on the verge of making the debt unserviceable. Enormous increases in the balance sheets of the world's major central banks, increased geopolitical conflict, and rising commodity prices particularly the price of oil, which could inhibit economic growth rates, 
and heighten the trend toward mercantilism. And the continuation, if not expansion, of the global excess savings problem, which was the fundamental thing that laid the foundation for the crisis in the first place. Middle class working families worldwide have a reason to be angry. And the question is whether additional austerity policies to bring down debt will be productive at this time. So here are some questions that this panel might address. Global public and private debt now exceeds an astonishing 300% of GDP. Yet long-term interest rates have continued, in most cases, to trade at surprisingly low levels. The debt has skyrocketed interest rates, of course with the exception of bond spreads in the euro periphery, have stayed low. The Keynesian, Ricardian, and Austrian theorists are all out in full force trying to explain what happened. Why hasn't the debt come at a higher cost of higher interest rates with more swiftly rising inflationary expectations? Is the world experiencing a stubborn output gap that won't go away? Is a spike in inflationary expectations just a matter of time? Or are the central bankers simply preventing the market process from, work, from working? <clears throat> Economists Jacob Kierkegaard, Balin Sbranscio, and Carmen Reinhardt argue that the goal of today's industrial world policymakers has been to manipulate markets to achieve negative real interest rates. They label this process financial repression. Governments force buyers, mostly central banks and their new proxies, the large international banks, to buy public debt to maintain negative real interest rates for the purpose of increasing inflation. Inflation, of course, reduces the value of the debt. But isn't inflation also a highly regressive tax, quote unquote, on the livelihoods of middle class working family? In, in the end, hasn't financial repression also become a simply a clever way to finance expanding government at cheaper rates and where, where central bankers have become the handmaidens of governments. Doesn't this policy shift the burden of debt from the public sector to the private sector? And to what degree have today's aggressive monetary policies become a de facto worldwide race to the bottom exchange rate policy to achieve competitive advantage? The world has reason to be nervous about today's extraordinary level of public debt, but the issue today is whether austerity to bring down the debt is a medicine capable of killing the patient. In recent years, policymakers have operated under, under the theory that tough fiscal policy reforms could actually be expansionary. Has this so-called expansionary contraction thesis worked for Ireland, Spain, and Greece? Isn't the danger that austerity increases the potential for a downward spiral, collapsing demand and employment? This triggers declining tax revenues such that budget deficits and debt actually increase. Now, Greece is hardly guilt-free. Its policymakers cook the books. But the Greek debt-to-GDP ratio, 120% of GDP at the start of the crisis now exceeds 160%, which brings up an important question. Can there be bailouts for a country where a functioning government no longer exists? Or a country with a political system in waiting that is no longer committed to past agreements? Mr. Sarkozy, call your office. Isn't lack of confidence the ultimate problem plaguing the Eurozone? In other words, muddling through while shouldering the load of Greek, Portuguese, and Irish debt may be tough, but is doable for the core countries. Add Italy and Spain to the list, however, and confidence collapses. Global bond traders know the numbers needed for any ESM rescue exercise would simply be too large, even for Germany. And besides, even if the Eurozone achieves temporary stability in bond spreads, won't the seven trillion euro sovereign debt elephant in the corner of the room still remain? To what degree will the bond market vigilantes be waiting forever at the door. Some analysts argue that the problem in the Eurozone is the Euro itself and the lack of convergence in levels of competitiveness with sharp disparities in current account imbalances. Currency risk has therefore been converted into credit risk. The banking and sovereign debt crises are thus symptoms, not causes, of a Eurozone no longer able to achieve convergence. 
This situation has left many nations with a desperate need for dramatic currency depreciation, but of course they have no way out. Aren't Sweden, Finland, Mexico, and Brazil all recent cases in which austerity policies to bring down debt worked precisely because those countries achieved an export boom? Isn't Eurozone austerity without a dramatic increase in periphery exports a recipe for disappointments? The new buzz phrase is that the Eurozone needs an economic growth strategy. With currency depreciation off the table, what would that growth policy be? Would a cut in the ECB's short-term interest rates make a difference? It seems doubtful. Is it realistic to expect core countries to develop more pro-consumption policies? Then there's the proposal by former Obama economic advisor Larry Summers, who urges what he calls contingent commitments to fiscal change. In other words, the deadline for austerity reforms is enforced only when certain economic thresholds are reached. Would such a delaying strategy for the Eurozone backfire with financial markets? In closing, let's pull back and look at the global economy again. Is the world, particularly the United States and Europe, experiencing an innovation gap? In other words, ultimately, economic growth stems not from expansion of central bank balance sheets or increased debt, but from technological and scientific innovation that enhances productivity. In recent decades, have the benefits of innovation, including the digitalization of economies, been largely canceled out by a large rise in the real cost of energy? In response to this innovation gap, did the industrialized world substitute leverage and a series of financial bubbles for the hard work of achieving true technological and scientific breakthroughs? Was the ballooning of the, do of the dot com bubble in the, of the late 90s, for example, an effort to compensate for long term stagnation in wages and salaries? And when that bubble burst, did the system open the door a decade later for real estate and sovereign debt related bubbles? Is today's monetary bubble the new route to prosperity? If so, are there limits to the expansion of central bank balance sheets? Does the quality of the assets on those balance sheets matter? What does it mean if the world's central banks all engage in expansionary policies while their governments fixate on achieving export-led growth? Is the world comp if the world is comprised of exporters, and President Obama now wants to double the U.S. exports in five years, joining the export club with Germany, China, and Japan, who will be the world's consumer? <clears throat> then there's the question of whether economies are becoming immune to monetary stimulus. In 2007 to 2008, for example, it took a trillion dollars in monetary stimulus to send global equity markets soaring. In the 2010 to 2011 period, however, it took more than 2.5 trillion to do the job. When the, when the next time comes, will central banks need to pump out 5 trillion or even 10 trillion to prevent an equity market catastrophe? And who really knows the long-term implications of this global monetary overhang? If the result turns out to be rampant inflation, middle-class working families will be, the hurt, will be hurt the most. Now, thankfully, the world may no longer have a liquidity problem, and it may no longer even have a solvency problem, but what we clearly have is a potential political problem. The great unknown unknown may well be political. Could the next black swan of systemic risk entail a political surprise beyond any of our imaginations? Thank you very much. Now, we have an extraordinary lineup of original thinkers. Uh, their biographies are listed, so I'm not going to repeat them, but just offer a few quick descriptions. Jörg Esmussen is today, quite simply, one of Germany's three or four most important policymakers, and that goes without saying. Eric Bergloff is one of the driving forces at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. 
Angel Gurria, of course, is the famous star of international finance, one of the great wise men, not only of Mexican economic affairs, but of global economic affairs. Axel Legion Hufford is well known as one of the world's premier experts on Keynes and monetary theory. And last but not least, Hans Joachim Voth is a leading expert on sovereign debt as it relates to political and social instability. And what topic could be hotter today? So let's begin with Mr. Osmussen. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, Dave, thank you very much. I'm not sure if I'm the right person. I think you posed 112 questions, and I'm not really know how many answers I have to this. Nevertheless, policymakers need to decide on what they are doing. So I will try my, my best. I thank for the, the invitation to this conference. Um, being together with very valued colleagues and, and friends. I'm not sure when I read the title, the Institute for New Economic Thinking, um, then arriving here as a central banker, that is a little bit a contradiction in terms, central banking and new economic thinking. So what I will try to do is to present you, of course, the official ECB position on how we see the economic situation and what we think is the right policy answer. But nevertheless, privately, I will carefully listen to new ideas, what we can learn from the crisis, what we can make better to prevent crisis, what can we make better in managing crisis. So I will silently listen and not commenting on, on all of those ideas. Dave, you rightly said we are faced in a situation with an, an ongoing sovereign debt woes and financial market turbulences stemming from unsustainable fiscal policy and excessive public and private debt levels in at least some Eurozone countries. And the policy changes in such a situation are without doubt enormous and the solutions are not clear cut and the academic advice to put this mildly varies widely on what one should do in the, the current situation. I want to remind you at the beginning that the best contribution a central bank can make to employment and growth is to provide price stability and to contribute to financial market stability. So when one look at this to the mandate the ECB has, there is a clear hierarchy in these goals. Our primary goal is to achieve price stability and it, then it says later, a few sentences later in the statute, the mandate is to contribute to financial stability. So I will briefly comment on the, the current economic situation and then discussing the role of three levels of policy making. It's first the role of the ECB, then the role of Euro area governments and third the European level in the resolution of the current crisis. When we take stock of the current situation, we have the background of a successful debt exchange in Greece and the process this in our view should remain unique and exceptional. We see a substantial reinforcement of both European crisis management framework, the new firewalls decided at the finance ministers meetings just last weekend, weekend and a new economic governance framework. And probably most importantly, we see steps of growth enhancing structural reforms and fiscal consolidation in the vulnerable states of the Euro area. And we see signs of stabilization in sovereign debt markets, though in a still fragile 
environment, you all see what happened to Spain in the, the last days. We see economic growth stabilizing at low levels. We would predict for this year, in real terms, only a mild recession for the Eurozone. And our expectation is that economic activity will recover gradually over the course of the year. Inflation in the euro area remains in check. Current rates are somewhat above 2%. They are driven exclusively by rises in energy prices and indirect taxes. And we expect inflation to return to levels below 2% early next year. Moreover, in an environment of modest growth and well-anchored inflation expectations, price pressures should remain rather limited. Despite these positive signs in the financial economic situations, there are still a number of downside risks to the euro area economy. First, it is that public debt and sometimes also private debt in the euro area is still too high. And there are risks that tensions in euro area debt markets reappear and spill over into the real economy. What is needed? We need a robust macroeconomic stabilization to shield the euro area, to make it more resilient against financial market turbulences, and to fully overcome the current crisis. For this to happen, the stabilization must be based on three key responsibilities. First one is with the ECB, strictly to adhere to our mandate to maintain price stability and to contribute to financial market stability. Second, it's the responsibility of euro area governments. And third, it's the European level in engaging into appropriate policies and reforms. Let me turn first to the role of the ECB in the current crisis, discussing some of our standard and non-standard measures. As you know, in the wake of the, the Lehman Brothers default, when the global financial crisis turned into a deep global economic crisis, the ECB has reacted promptly and lowered its interest rates rapidly between October 2008 and May 2009 from four and a quarter percent to one percent. These standard monetary policy decisions were accompanied by non-standard measures, which became necessary when financial market disruptions threatened to undermine the effectiveness of our central bank monetary policy actions. Most prominently, the ECB decided to provide unlimited liquidity at a fixed rate to its counterparties via our refinancing operation at various maturities against collateral as laid down in our collateral framework. These measures were taken as funding pressures stemming from the tensions in financial markets were threatening to disrupt the flow of credit to the real economy. Indeed, the liquidity provision was intended to ease the funding of financial institutions, which in turn fund small and medium-sized enterprises, the drivers of growth and job creation in the euro area. More recently, we had seen a re-emergence of banks' funding pressures, also against the background of the tensions in sovereign debt markets. It becomes more and more clear that we have a close interlinkage between the banking sector and the sovereign debt. And the ECB, as you know, subsequently conducted two three-year refinancing operations, the LTROs, in December and one in February to help easing prevailing funding pressures. Our preliminary assessment shows that indeed the three-year LTOs have alleviating, deleveraging pressures. Signs of this positive effect can be identified, for example, through increases in bank holdings of private securities 
and to a lesser extent in interbank loans. Moreover, the three-year LTRO liquidity has significantly eased banks' funding pressures, both in the markets for unsecured debt as well as in the money market. Whether the LTRO liquidity will end up in increased loan provisions, this has to be seen and will take time as banks need to transform central bank money into commercial money. This depends not least on the bank's financial strength, their risk aversion, and on the demand for credit by non-financial corporations and private households. Did the LTRO solve the current problems? No. And this was not the intention. It bought time for governments to act. We have done our part, providing an environment of, I think one can say, ample liquidity and low interest rates. And now it's up to the governments to do their part. Let me sum up the role of the ECB in the current crisis with three main messages. First, the ECB's crisis measures, standard as well as non-standard, were not taken despite the ECB's mandate. They were because of the ECB's mandate to preserve price stability and to contribute to financial market stability. This means, despite some criticism we receive also in a country that I know pretty good, we remain fully, fully faithful to our mandate. Second, the ECB's performance with respect to its primary objective, price stability, is undisputed. The euro area's inflation performance is remarkable, with inflation in check and inflation expectations well anchored, fully in line with our aim of inflation rates below but close to 2% in the medium term. And third, the ECB will act when needed. Like last spring, when the economic outlook had improved and we had carefully started raising interest rates. Moreover, all our non-standard measures are temporary and exceptional by nature. This means we are carefully monitoring to what extent the extra liquidity translates into lending and investment decisions of banks and ultimately into macroeconomic developments concerning output and inflation. Our primary objective is price stability and we will conduct and we will continue to deliver on this irrespective of persistent public debt overhang in some euro area countries. Let me turn to the role of euro area governments in the resolution of the current crisis. As mentioned before, the burden to resolve the sovereign debt crisis has to be carried by euro area governments. It is their responsibility to restore market confidence, and this is key, by bringing public finances back to a sustainable path. I think we should not forget that some of the vulnerable euro area member states had already accumulated large fiscal imbalances in good times. The global financial and economic crisis then acted as a catalyst for adverse fiscal developments, owing to the automatic reaction of government balances to the economic cycle, the fiscal stimulus packages introduced by governments to counter the economic downturn into support and the support provided to the financial sector. Additionally, lapses in competitiveness have left a number of the same countries with few prospects to outgrow the elevated debt-to-GDP ratios. There is therefore a clear need for these countries to adopt ambitious reform of fiscal consolidation. Some and some of you present have questioned the viability 
of such bold consolidation programs on the grounds of their adverse effects on growth and ultimately social cohesion. One should, however, not forget the following. First, as you know, there is a large body of empirical literature suggesting that long-term effects of fiscal consolidation on growth and employment is often positive and sizable, whereas the short-term effects undisputedly can be negative. The finding, however, crucially depends on the composition of fiscal adjustment and the starting environment. In particular, consolidation that is based on a permanent reduction in government transfers appear to be less detrimental in terms of foregone growth compared to cuts in public investment. This holds notably when fiscal consolidation is accompanied by growth enhancing structural reforms. In addition, one can expect the negative effects on short-term growth to be mitigated by confidence effects if the initial fiscal position is unsustainable. Second, we had periods of extended fiscal consolidation in the euro area. This is not new, particularly in the run-up to the EMU in the 90s. Many EU member states responded to levels of debt and deficit above the Maastricht criteria with significant primary surpluses over extended periods of time. Our research shows that these periods of consolidation had no adverse effects on long-term growth. Third, fiscal consolidation in the euro area and particular in program countries and other vulnerable member states is already progressing. As a consequence, the average fiscal deficit ratio is much lower in the euro area than in other regions of the world, means the US or Japan, for example. The progress should be no reason for complacency. Consolidation must continue and need to be complemented, and this is the final and last layer of action of the European level. The situation and the developments of the last 18 to 24 months clearly showed that we had deficiencies in the governance, especially of the euro area, and there's a whole range of activities to improve this. It's called the six-pack, the twin-pack, the fiscal compact, to use all these stylized Brussels language. All these activities have one thing in mind, to give us clearer rules, better decision-making at the European level. I think it is key that we manage to set up a government structure that complements the monetary area with elements of a fiscal union that satisfy the stability needs of the monetary zone. This is why we think that the fiscal compact is the first step towards a fiscal union. Other steps will need to follow. But it's a first step and it's a right step. And one should be honest, especially here in Germany, that being a member of a monetary union means de facto in parts being a member of a political union. We have to deal then, of course, since the crisis management actions in the last two years were mainly intergovernmental, that we go back to the con community method and that we involve the European Parliament in these activities better than in the crisis management mode of the last two years. So actions at these three levels have been taken. They need to be taken much more. It's sometimes confusing to see the strategy. I would say there is a clear comprehensive strategy to deal with the situation in, in Europe. I want to be very clear, Europe is a safe place to invest 
And I'm convinced, I was in Ireland the last two days to see how the economic and political situation stands. And I am optimistic that, for example, a case like Ireland, where there is real ownership for the program, can develop into a real success story. Thank you very much. Yeah, on the uh, Eurozone firewall, do you, um, do you have uh, any thoughts about uh, the future, uh, any future changes there? Do you, the, uh, the enhanced international role, uh, um, where do you believe that discussion is going? I mean, this is always, I mean, you asked the question rightly, let's say, a week after a decision was taken to increase the European firewalls. So I suppose this one should now first be implemented. I think it was a good decision that European finance ministers have taken last week to increase the combined instruments of European firewalls to reach a firewall of one trillion US dollars. So I think this is a satisfactory outcome and one should not repeat and open the debate week by week. So what is now on the agenda next week in Washington to deal with IMF resources because the European governments have done their part. They already have pledged to provide 150 billion euros via bilateral loans to IMF resources, so I now would expect our non-European friends and partners to contribute their part to IMF resources. But to be clear, whatever size of firewall you have, globally or in Europe, it is never a substitute for fiscal consolidation and growth enhancing structural reforms at the level of member states. Great, well thank you very much.